Hello, um, I'm your host, Adam Lowenstein, and uh, it's an honor and a pleasure uh, to welcome director David Cronenberg to our show today. Uh, this is a program dedicated to uh, exploring horror in more ambitious in, and intellectually adventurous ways than it's often discussed. Uh, hello, David, and thank Hi. you for joining us. Sure. Great to have you. Your films have constantly challenged the boundaries between horror and art. Um, and so I wanted to ask you to get things going, just what has the term horror meant to you uh, over the course of your career and, 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 and what does it mean now? Right. Well, I, I, I never thought of myself as a horror filmmaker particularly. But in fact, uh, when I started to write uh, what was eventually called Shivers uh, here and they came from within in the U.S., I was really not thinking, okay, now I'm going to write a script for a horror film and it will be, there's a place for it in, in the marketplace where I can get it financed and distributed. Uh, it really just came up. It surprised me that that's what I wrote. I had not been an obsessive fan of horror, particularly. I was always interested in sci-fi. So of course, as a young kid who had some interest in technology, naturally sci-fi was of interest horror somewhat less. <clears throat> and, um, I had seen night of the living dead, which was, which really did affect me. I mean, it was really quite a strong film and made a big impression on me. I guess it was around 1968 yes. uh, where I had really only started to make underground films at that point, which were inspired by the New York underground, you know, more like Andy Warhol, um, Ed Amschwiller. And so, so it was, that was really my orientation rather than commercial horror films, let's say. And I remember coming out of seeing Night of the Living Dead and just everybody who approached me on the street, I started to look at them in quite a different way, I have to say. <laughs> and I thought, well, that's interesting that this film did that to me. And I must say, um, in Shivers, once I had it made, there were, there were a couple of scenes towards the end, which, which were, I wouldn't say they were homages, but they were definitely, there was definitely George's influence there in Night of the Living Dead. So what came up out of the typewriter, and we were using typewriters in those days, was uh, a horror film, undeniably. And uh, that surprised me. I didn't fight it. It was natural. It felt good. I, I felt I had some innovative and interesting things uh, to 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 write about and to film. And of course, I I had then then once I had written this, I started to focus on the horror genre, and I was looking at film horror films from England, from America, of course, and from from anywhere that there were low budget horror films, because I was thinking, well, this is really where I am. I, I actually had flown to LA, uh, to talk to Roger Corman's people and, uh, um, AIP, you know, it, 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 anybody who was making low budget horror films. And I, that was an interesting experience. It was my first time in LA. I was there with my friend, Norman Snyder, who was a writer who eventually co-wrote Dead Ringers with me. And I was thinking because I had had problems getting any interest in Canada that uh, I might have to move to LA to get this film made. The fact that it was a horror film was an impediment in Canada because the films that did get made were often films about life on the prairies, the difficulty of being a fisherman in, in Newfoundland and all of that, very sort of docudrama kind of orientation and films of fantasy, uh, never mind horror films were just not on the board. I mean, there's nobody was doing that. And so it was hard to get, there was a government fund that, that eventually became Telefilm Canada, but it was created just to support young filmmakers and to try to develop a film industry, trying to convince, you know, government bureaucrats that, <laughs> that this script called Shivers originally was called orgy of the blood parasites. I wasn't too serious about that title, but it did seem to cover the ground. Um, you know, that was difficult. Can you imagine a bureau, a government bureaucrat in, in Ottawa or capital city reading, reading that <laughs> they didn't know how to deal with it, but eventually they, they 
caved and they supported the film and invested in the film, which is extraordinary when you think of it. Even then, I was, there was no question in my mind about, were you there, am I now cementing myself into the, the wall as a, as a, as a hor horror filmmaker? It never occurred to me. I, I just did. I understood that I was, it was part of the genre and then I would, would therefore be dealing with other people who were involved in the genre, but I, it never, I, I, I remember doing, um, an interview show with, uh, John Landis and John Carpenter and, um, Mick Garris was the host and we were all doing interviews together. I'm sure that's on the net somewhere. And, uh, after the. After we had done our interviews, I saw them, they, they were kind of looking at me kind of strangely. I said, what, what's, what, what's going on? They said, well, you called yourself an artist in that interview. We would never do that. And I said, well, I am, you know, why, why not? <laughs> yeah. Somehow part of it being a horror filmmaker for them was to be kind of modest in a strange way, you know, to not to, 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 to think you were just making popcorn movies and you were there to just entertain the fans, which of course is always part of it, but, um, but that there was no serious artistic intent in what you were doing, or if there was, you wouldn't admit it, not even to yourself, because that would somehow derange you and make put too much pressure on you. For me, it was all be, always obvious. And I think. Despite the fact that Shivers is a bit rough because it was my first film, I was learning everything, you know, I mean, I had shot my long, my two long, um, underground films myself and they were, they were pretty elegant, but I had no pressure then. I was, I could shoot whenever I felt like that, like it, there was shooting with my friends. There were no unions involved, no time constraints, min minimal technology, you know, the first time I saw the dailies of what we had shot with, um, shivers, I thought this is terrible. This looked bad. I mean, they don't even know how to get the weight close up distance or how their heads are different sizes in the front room. Like, God, maybe I can't, I really can't do this. But then the next day's rushes were better. And then gradually I thought, okay, I think I can, I think I do have an eye, uh, and I think I can make movies. That was the struggle, not. Anything to do with horror or not horror? Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, it's 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 a an eloquent way of articulating uh, what I've always felt about your films, which is that the horror in them is always connected to other things to the point where horror, as a sort of an overarching definition, often doesn't quite work as an explanatory frame. Yeah. Uh, uh, but at the same time, your work, I think, really expands our sense of what horror can encompass and, and, and asks us questions about like, well, why we didn't, why didn't we think about this as horror or why have we not sort of, uh, imagined things that feel more artistic or, or serious or, or literary as, as connected to horror in, in, in some way. And yeah, it's, it's, um, I mean, I began to realize that in filmmaking, not necessarily literature, but in filmmaking, you could be protected by the genre label of horror because you were allowed to explore things there that would have been considered quite improper in a serious dramatic film. So it, it kind of protected you as a young filmmaker, for one thing, you were a little bit under, under the radar, except, you know, for the f horror fans and so on, but in general. And it allowed, it could allow you to develop as a filmmaker without quite the pressure of being, you know, an art house darling, which some early filmmakers were in their first couple of films. For me, it, it, I, I gradually began to think of it as a, as a marketing device, just to call it some horror film or, uh, or a sci-fi film or, you know, as you're giving it a particular genre label, I thought this is all. It's valuable for marketing because you can target a particular audience with your advertising if you don't have a huge advertising budget and so on. But you see, and you know, recently, I mean, it's interesting that Guillermo del Toro has had success, you know, with the Oscars and so on with the sci-fi horror films. 
and uh, that the, the French film Titan won the Palme d'Or in, in Cannes. But I can tell you, uh, when I had uh, a history of violence playing at the Cannes Film Festival, history of violence was incredibly popular for, with the audiences at Cannes. Um, and, and the, the director of the festival was asked, why was there not even a, a, you know, an acting, uh, award given to this wonderful film. And he said, well, if this was a genre of film festival, it would have, of course, won a prize. And that was shocking to me, given also, I have to say that I ended up at one point being the president of the jury at the Cannes Film Festival. And I made sure that there, there was no distinction to be made in terms of genre or not genre. I said, if you, if you are, if you really think a, a film that is a gangster film or a horror film or a sci-fi film is the best film, then forget about all the other considerations you vote for. It. So it, it's, there's still a stigma attached to that label, which in terms of, you know, prize giving and, and that whole, that whole structure. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and I think, you know, there's no doubt in my mind that something like Titan winning that award, uh, and not just the award, but Titan as, as a, uh, a film willing to take the risks that it takes is sort of unthinkable without your career and, and, and the risks that you took in order to sort of take things that we consider, as you were saying, improper or, or sort of ill-fitting in, in sort of serious dramatic context, something that does fit and, 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 and does require, uh, uh, serious consideration and, and, uh, and respect. And, and I, I think the same for, uh, for Del Toro, the same for Get Out. I mean, these are all films that I think build off of what, what you and, and your compatriots in the seventies were, were building without knowing it, probably a foundation for these sort of later films as art, as well as horror. So I hope, I hope all these people have thanked you as well. <laughs> well, of course, Guillermo has always told me that he, he was um, influenced by my work. And of course he moved to Toronto as did George. And suddenly Toronto became the horror film capital of, the, of North America. And also Julia Ducournau, the director, writer of uh, Titan, told me that I was a big influence. And that was it's very sweet to hear that. Very, it's, it's lovely to hear that. They're my children, you know, <laughs> I, 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 I love it. And, uh, uh, you know, maybe even children in, 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 in the brood sense too, right? <laughs> yes. They're a little uncontrollable and could be dangerous. Yes. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. You know, something that, uh, you, you wrote, uh, relatively recently in 2014, I wanted to ask you about, which is your, uh, your introduction to a new translation of Kafka's the metamorphosis and, uh, and in that introduction, uh, you, you compare, uh, Gregor Samsa waking up, uh, and realizing he's, a, a, a beetle, a giant beetle to your, your own waking up and realizing that you are 70 years old. I am a, be I am a beetle. There's no question. Yeah. I'm now, I, I just turned 79 last month or a couple of weeks ago, actually. Yeah. It's, it's there. That's really one of the great short stories of all time, of course. And, uh, one of the reasons it is, is because it has so many ripples and amplifications and levels of interpretation and understanding, because once again, you could say that that's a horror short story. Exactly. I don't think anybody really puts it in that category, but I do. <laughs> no, no, I mean, but you know, of, of official literary criticism, um, but it, yeah, sure it is. It's also a, in a way a sci-fi story as well. Uh, and it, it just, there, you, you can't really separate its power from its genre. You know, you, it, it's powerful because of that fantasy element that is, it's written so deadpan, so flat, so just so realistically that you, you don't question it, even though of course it's impossible. So it has to do with incredible transformations and it, and of course in that story, there's a lot of social commentary as well, uh, about family, about, uh, class, about all kinds of things. It's amazing. If you needed to demonstrate 
the possibilities of, uh, of creativity, of creative ex exploration of what the human condition is. You just need to point to that short story, uh, to show that there are things that you can do within the genre that you cannot do outside of it. That's, that's a wonderful way of, uh, of, of, of talking about the metamorphosis as something that's worth thinking about within the frame of horror. But as you said, it's, 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 it's really never considered in that, in that no. uh, frame. Um, and, uh, and I think what you do in that introduction by, uh, by bringing yourself into the, the story of the metamorphosis, um, yeah. you, you, you do point to themes of aging and horror, uh, that, um, that have been present, it feels like in your work from, from the very beginnings to, 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 to the present. Yeah. Um, and I, I was just wondering if, uh, that comparison you make of, you know, Gregor as, 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 as Beatle and, and you as 70, I mean, does this indicate that, you know, you're thinking about the relationship between horror and aging in, in new ways or, or in ways that feel sort of of a piece, you know, with, with your career as a whole at this point? Well, you know, for me, the essence of horror is the human body. I mean, I've never been very interested in this sort of, uh, sort of the religious aspects of, let's say the exorcist. Although of course, ultimately that is a body focused story as well. Um, for me, the, we are bodies that the essence of art is about the human body. That's what I think. Um, and, uh, and it no more is it, in no other place is it more fo focused than in the horror genre, the, the body is the, the, the core of all the discussions of horror. Even when you're talking about the brain, you know, when you talk about somebody who is insane, murderously insane. That's a body thing. That's the, the brain is the body. And I, I do think of myself philosophically as an existentialist. And I think that that, you know, that's a, that was a very popular thing to be in the 1950s in France. <laughs> but, um, I still think that there's an essence of, of what I do that is, is expressed if you want in philosophy. For me, it means that we are a body that we grow, we live, we transform, we die. When we die, we are gone as, as human beings, not physically, you know, the, the, our atoms, our, our molecules are still around. Um, but, um, and that's for a self-aware thinking creature. That's a hard thing to accept. And for me, religion and art and many other things come out of the attempt to deal with our, uh, transitory existence. And of course, um, there are more sort of commonly, uh, noted expressions of, of that in terms of commercials about getting rid of wrinkles and, you know, and how to make your eyes glow a little better and how to basically to recapture your youth, let's say. Because what it, what what aging is all about is death, of course, it's the end of your life, and it's it's a, it's not an easy thing for a human being to accept. And the attempt to avoid that acceptance, it can produce quite interesting creative things. <laughs> As I say, for, for me, all religion is that. But I think that was kind of a nice connection that occurred to me when I was asked to write, if I would write that preface to, to a metamorphosis. Yeah. I, I, I was very moved by it. And, and it made me also think, uh, about other affinities between your work and Kafka's, uh, that I was curious if you felt as well. And, and, and that's, uh, Jewishness, not, not, not as a religion, but as a, as a social category, really. Yeah. And, uh, to me, you and Kafka are similar in that Jewishness is often, uh, most often implicit rather than, than explicit, uh, in, in the work. Um, yeah. but that it also forms a, uh, a powerfully shaping influence in some kind of way. But I, I, I was curious, you know, about your sense of this, uh, in, in, mm -hmm. in, 
in your own work? Well, it's definitely there. I was raised in a very in a totally secular household. I never went to what we call Jewish school. I never learned Hebrew. It would have been nice if I had, but I didn't. I, I learned Latin instead. <laughs> I'm a Hebrew <laughs> school dropout myself, so. <laughs> <laughs> That's another way of dealing with it. But um, yeah, I mean, there's, but I'm definitely Jewish. I feel I'm very Jewish. There's no question, but it's it's more a cultural thing and, and uh, also a physical thing. Uh, it was interesting for me to see that George Romero's mother was Lithuanian. I don't, I don't think she probably was Lithuanian Jewish, but my background is all Lithuanian Jewish. Also, my, my mother and father both were from the same small town, uh, Pilvisha, in Lithuania. Uh, even though they came to Toronto in different ways, my mother was born in Toronto. My father was born in Baltimore. They met in Toronto at Harvard Collegiate uh, High School, which is the school I went to, and uh, so on. But they ended up. But so um, the the culture, the the respect for art. My mother was a pianist. Uh, my my father was a writer. The respect for music, art, literature and learning and, and academic studies, very Jewish, all of that. And, uh, and, uh, I am a, a product of that household for sure. Definitely. And, you know, it, 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 you know, one of my, uh, favorite films of yours, uh, is, is, is a film called, uh, a short film called at the suicide of the last Jew in the world and the last cinema mm -hmm. in the world, where you cast yourself in the title role. And I'm, so I'm curious to ask you a little more about that in relation to this question, but also to, 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 to bring in one of my favorite sequences in, in, in your films is that wonderful moment in a dangerous method when, uh, Jung and Freud have, have, have met and they're having that long, uh, uh, involved conversation and Jung, uh, is so involved in the conversation. He's piling food on his plate, uh, and, and sort of doesn't realize that the food was meant for Freud and his entire family and not just him. And, and, it, and it's a moment that always sort of struck me, especially within the context of the film as a whole, as a sort of subtle but wise acknowledgement of, of, you know, the blitheness and the blindness of not necessarily Jung, you know, not as an anti-Semite, but of anti-Semitism as something that um, sort of creeps into things that, yeah. you know, are not often acknowledged. So I, I, I was just wanted yeah. to throw those at you. That's lovely. That's a lovely observation. Um, Jung, I think now would be considered anti-Semitic, uh, though in his time, his attitude to Jews was very common and considered just normal observation, but he wrote very, very definitely that Jews, you know, because they did not have roots in the culture of Austria or Germany or wherever they had ended up after the diaspora were therefore, there was something missing. There was not, you know, see, you know, a serious, deep spiritual, intellectual connection to the land that they were in, that they were always outsiders, that they were always the wandering Jew, you know, that sort of thing. His, his attitude, as I say, now would be considered not publicly acceptable. So was he an anti you know, it doesn't make any sense. He had, a, he had a couple of lovers who were very Jewish. <laughs> so, you know, uh, as did Heidegger, as did Heidegger, who you could also say was quite anti-Semitic. So yes, I'm, I'm of course aware of all of that. And, and in, in that script, which was a beautiful script that those, those moments were, were, were meant to deliver that kind of observation. And it was something that I think despite his kind of obsession with Jewishness, uh, Jung would, would have been blind to certain realities of it since he hadn't lived them from the, that side. He, he was from, came from someplace else that was what we would now call privileged. Yes. 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 Yeah. And I really do think the film, you know, in its development of that, the series of tensions between Freud and Jung does, does a, a wonderful job of, uh, of, of weaving Jewishness and anti-Semitism, you know, in, in, into that, uh, in, nice. in, in ways that feel, uh, important and, and, and compelling and, and do make me 
you know, think back and, and just want to ask, you know, the, uh, about a little bit about the, the sort of the motivating impulse for at the suicide of the last Jew in the world, in the last in the world. And, and I know it was for a special occasion, um, yeah. but, but the decision to make it at all and, and to cast yourself in that role. Yeah. I'm just curious if you could, could say a little bit more. Yeah. And it's odd. I mean, I don't re recall it being provoked by any sort of international incident involving Israel, let's say, or anything like that. Uh, I don't really know where it came from. Well, I do know where it came from. It came from me, but, uh, in my background, but, um, yeah, it was, uh, once again, it, you, you, you start to write and you, you, you surprise yourself by what comes up on the, now on the screen instead of the paper. So I, I can't say that there was a particular thing that, that provoked that. Um, maybe it was always sitting around waiting there, you know, coiled inside me to come out. Because as you know, I, I don't really particularly deal with Jewishness, North American Jewishness, uh, the way the Chicago writers, you know, the way uh, Philip Roth and Saul Bellow had done. Um, they are, uh, they were another generation behind me and another generation closer to immigration. And so it, it was more, more of a, it was a different struggle for them dealing with their own Jewishness in North America. I never had that struggle. That was not, especially of course, Canada also was not the U S they're, they're quite different, more different than I think most Americans are aware of. So that it surprised me too, you know? Um, but I, I really, once I did it, it felt great. It was very cathartic. I must say. I, I quite enjoyed it and it got quite a good reaction. It was sort of commissioned by the Cannes Film Festival, not directly, but it was sort of, we will give you 20 wonderful filmmakers some money to make a short film and then we'll show them all at Cannes. And, uh, it was a lovely idea and, uh, <laughs> it got, it got quite a reaction there. I must say yeah. for, for yeah. just a few minutes of film. And, and, uh, to describe it as cathartic reminds me, uh, in, in a similar sort of context about how, how you, you, you've spoken before about how the, you know, the scene in rabid where you shoot Santa Claus, uh, was, was a cathartic moment <laughs> as, as, as well. And I, I wonder if that's, if that's, uh, that's in here too, because I think, you know, most Jewish viewers would know exactly what you mean with, well, I have to say. In a in a weird way, you're wrong because I I, I love Christmas. You see, yeah, I, and I, and and I didn't do any Jewish holidays. I mean, I it was Christmas was the big holiday, and and sort of Halloween, of course. So I, I loved Santa Claus and the reindeer and the elves and all that stuff. The presents we had in my family, we had a Christmas tree. You know, I mean, we were assimilated Jews, you know, it's beyond the, beyond the beyond of the assimilation. Um, we didn't do Hanukkah. We didn't do poor, you know, we didn't do the big, uh, Jewish holidays at all, but you know, the chance to kill Santa Claus, I mean, you've got to take it <laughs> when it presents itself. And, and, and bless you for that. Absolutely. You know, a theme that I feel like characterizes your work, uh, all the way from transfer, all the way to maps to the stars is therapy, you know, physical and or psychological therapy. Um, and there's so many different and fascinating instances of it in your, in your body of work that, you know, too, too many to list. But I, I was curious if you have a sense of what is it about therapy that, that draws you to it as a, as a theme it, over so many years in so many different ways. Well, it's interesting that so many Jews are involved in psychotherapy, being psychotherapists, being psychiatrists. And of course, Freud invented uh, psychotherapy basically. Um, and he was very Jewish. And so I've always lived with that as a possible career, as a possible something that I would undergo if I needed it. Uh, and it was interesting to see how that evolved with my friends and their marriages and so on, um, different kinds of therapy, art therapy, you know, they're just all kinds of r ramifications and, and uh, expressions of, of the therapeutic relationship. And I just thought 
what an interesting relationship that is of all the human relationships. It's a pretty recent one in some ways. You have a stranger who you open up your most intimate life to uh, in hopes of some kind of healing or understanding maybe is more like it. It's more like an understanding than healing. And, and that's sort of an interesting version of art. I mean, it, it's, uh, people say to me, you know, are you trying to shock your audience when you do this or surprise them or whatever? And I say, honestly, I'm doing it to myself first. I am, I think all art is the exploration of the human condition. That's what it is. And so I'm wandering around finding things and I'm saying, wow, look at this connection. Uh, I find this really stunning and really revealing. Uh, I'm going to show it to you. And then you can see, you, you tell me whether it has the same effect on you or not, is, or maybe you think it's trivial and not interesting. And uh, my goal was to make it non-trivial and make it interesting as an artist. That's my goal. So that, in a way, the, the therapy, the psychotherapy, the analysis, is is just a, it's kind of a, a a variant of the artistic process i think for me and that's what it is a dangerous method was rejected by the Cannes film festival even though i had been the president of the jury there and had a couple of films there already and uh we ended up taking it to venice where it was very well received and so on and later the the various people involved said that they thought yeah they made a mistake but not uh, including it. But I think their mistake was thinking that a dangerous method was not a real Cronenberg film because it was a horror film. It was a docudrama about real people. It was some scholarly and they missed what you just said. If you had been on the selection committee at Canada, I think we would have been in because you would have realized that for me to make a movie about Freud and Jung was just inevitable. I thought it was an inevitable, an inevitable thing to do, uh, to, to, instead of skirting around the issue of the therapeutic relationship, just go right to the source, which is Freud. Absolutely. And, and I have to say, you know, for me, the first time I saw a dangerous method was, was really, it felt like a, a key that was unlocking something in, in, in terms of my understanding of your your work in, in, in precisely the way that you're saying that, you know, oh, oh, of course, of course he's going to go to this place. And of course he's going, uh, to do this and the choice in the film. And, and, and this is probably, you know, what, what may have, uh, confused the, the, the can jury, but it shouldn't have is, is that, you know, so many of your explorations of therapeutic contexts in the past have come with very vivid uh, bodily imagery, um, to sort of, uh, make physical the, the, the often sort of cerebral elements of what goes on in a therapeutic, uh, uh, moment or a therapeutic relationship. And, and a dangerous method, it seems almost, um, programmatically and, and brilliantly, I think designed to, to keep that under wraps rather than to, uh, exploded. And, and, and so it means that, that, you know, we, we as viewers have to sort of, um, look for Cronenberg signatures in, in a different sort of way, but, but I think in a way that illuminates the entire body of work in, 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 in ways that are, are important. Um, but, but did it feel to you making that film that, uh, I mean, it sounds like you have a pretty natural organic process and, 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 and maybe the question to ask around this is actually, you know, I've seen you in different contexts, uh, and talk about how, when you're making a film, you could be completely in it and, and, and just, you know, the artist making the film and not thinking about or worrying about, well, how, how are people going to think about this? How are people going to receive it? How are people going to understand it? But then at the end of the process, with the film done and, and you're out there talking about it with, with viewers, um, you're able to be a viewer as well. You're able to look, look at the film and say, oh, this, this is interesting. And this thing you said about it is not necessarily something 
I was thinking during the the making of it, but now that you say it, it's interesting to talk about. Um, so, so I, I, I guess I'm curious, you know, about this relationship between yourself as the artist making the film and then yourself as the viewer watching it or, or, or reflecting on it. Yeah. Well, it's interesting, you know, Ivan Reitman, who just died recently. Very sad. Yeah. Was, that was a shock to me. He was a, he was a good friend and he was in a strange way, even though he was younger than I am, he was a mentor in that he had made a couple of commercial movies, mainstream movies. He, he, he was destined for Hollywood. I mean, for him, for me to go to Hollywood, we would be a kind of a, a betrayal of myself, but for him, no, it was a, that was the realization of himself. That's where he needed to be. He produced Shivers and Rabbit and he, he was, he always talked about the popcorn shot, you know, the one where the popcorn would go flying because the audience was shocked, like the head exploding in scanners, which he didn't produce, but, um, and he made me, you know, up to that point, I had been an underground filmmaker where you didn't really think you would have an audience. So you weren't really that concerned. You never expected to have a thousand people watching your underground film. So you weren't really worried about that. Right. Uh, whereas these more mainstream films, suddenly a commercial film, Shivers was my first professional film in the sense that I was paid to do it. And there was a whole structure around that. So from Ivan, I got, I, I was made very aware of the audience and the need to pamper the audience in the sense that you needed them to understand things and you needed to please them and you needed to give them pleasure. And it couldn't just be a sort of cerebral meditation that was only inside your own head. And so I, I learned that from him, um, in, in a very direct way. Of course, I had seen as a kid by that time, thousands of movies. Uh, so I, I my nervous system understood all of that. But, uh, but it was kind of a revelation to be working with a producer who was very focused on that. And that, that never left me really, because it is part of the relationship. I mean, you are, I always was aware that I am seducing the audience. Um, there's a seduction involved. It could be very elaborate and very strange. It could be very perverse, but it is a seduction. Therefore, I would say that when I'm shooting the movie, well, I am thinking about the audience. I would have thought of them when I was writing the script, let's say, or overseeing the script, because in the script, I would say, well, the audience is not going to understand this. They're not going to understand why this is happening. Now, maybe we don't want them to understand it, but at least we should look at it and decide that rather than have it accidentally happen that a key piece of understanding is missing from this film. On the other hand, you are creating something that is like when you have a child, you know, the kid grows up and you have a big influence on that kid, but boy, anybody who's had a couple of kids could tell you that they are their own creatures the instant they appear and even before, and then they go off into the world and they become their own creature beyond you. Yes, you are always an influence in their life, but you are not controlling them. You are not you know, they, they, they have their own life and your movie, I was aware, will have that too. It will go out into the world like your kid. It will have its own adventures. It will meet its own people that you don't even know, like you, for example, I'm only meeting you now, but, uh, you've met all of my movie children and, uh, had your relationship with them. And so that's a wonderful thing when it works and, uh, um, but you, you can't lose sight, as I say, you can't lose sight of that as a filmmaker. So I'm, I'm, I am conscious of that. It's not just, and it, and it happens in editing too. You know, you can edit things to be more obscure or not, and you have to make a decision. Well, why, why am I cutting this action sequence so quickly that nobody really understands what's going on? Well, one reason was that you didn't shoot it well enough. But the other reason is because you don't want them to know exactly what's going on yet, maybe later, that, that kind of thing. So it's always in my mind while I'm writing, certainly, and while I'm shooting. And, and, and this imagination of the audience, you know, as, as you've gone on, you know, in a career that, that, that spans many decades now and, and many different kinds of films with many different kinds of generic, uh, 
marketing signifiers attached to them. Do you ever think about a Cronenbergian audience, you know, an audience that, that has sort of been following you from the beginnings to the present or, or, or is your imagination of an audience as you're sort of in the process, you know, something that's more attached to the, the specific project? No, I don't think of a Cronenbergian audience. No. Um, I would, I would think that would be too limiting. I mean, I would think that, you know, each film has its own particular life, um, I, 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 you can get into some strange things. You might say, oh my God, you know, the, the people who love, you know, um, scanners, which has a th therapeutic element in it, are For not sure. going to really, they're not going to like a dangerous method, you know, there's no, there's no, there's no creative advantage for me to think that way. And very naturally also, I don't think that way. I think it, it's always exciting to get an audience that you didn't have before. And that's, that's sort of more exciting really. And the fact that you might not offend, but you know, sort of disappoint an audience that you had before, that's incalculable anyway. You can't really be sure that that's the case, you know? And, um, when I meet fans and, you know, when I'm in a film festival or whatever, I get incredible stuff. I mean, some people say, you know, you, uh, the, the film of yours, I love the best is Spider, you know, um, or the, the film I love best is Crash or, or, you know, you just don't know. Or I loved your early films because that's when I was developing as a filmmaker. There's just so many things. So I think it would be a fool's game to truly really pursue a particular audience that you felt you had already. And it would be a disservice to them, I think, to limit yourself to what you think they like, because you can be surprised by them. Of course, they can like stuff or hate stuff that you would never imagine they'd react that way. So it's sort of, once you, once you unleash your movie, it's like, it's open season, you know, it's open season for everybody who might be interested in seeing your film. Right, right, right. You know, a dimension of your work that seems like it hasn't been recognized or discussed as much as it, it, it seems like it should be is, is your sense of humor and, 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 and how funny your films can be. And I, I can imagine reasons why this hasn't sort of leaped to the forefront, uh, uh, necessarily when, when, when so many of the, uh, the impacts of your films can be, uh, uh, shocking and disturbing and, and, and tragic and, and, uh, and sad. Uh, and that's all there and true, but I also feel like your films does not have a sort of zero sum game where the humor is sort of, uh, not in league with those sorts of effects and doing other sorts of work as well. So I, I was just curious if, if you had thoughts about the place of humor in your, in your work. Well, Jews are funny, you know. <laughs> and I got to ask you about Mel Brooks at some point too. Yeah, well, Jews are funny, and and uh, and that's part of the culture of Jewishness is that you don't take yourself too seriously, as well as you do take yourself seriously at the same time. Um, you could put it down to that, or you could just put it down to me. But um, a movie without humor is to me l losing the possibility for a very interesting additional facet of the movie that you're making. Um, and to have characters, all your characters have zero sense of humor to me seems dehumanizing basically, because everybody uses humor to cope with existence. <laughs> There's no way around it. Some are better at it than others, but I think everybody does it. So to me, that would be, uh, I mean, it could be a specific choice that you could, you know, make a movie deliberately without humor, even though there's always the possibility of unintentional humor. Something that isn't funny in North America might be quite funny in Italy, let's say. So there's the cultural thing too, that would, that you can't really control the way your film is perceived in different cultures depends a lot on those cultures and you can't control that either. So, um, uh, all of my films are funny, I think, 
you know, I, I sometimes like to say the brood was my least funny film because I was in my least funny moment at that, when I made that film. And maybe that's true. I'm sure there's some jokes in there though. Anyway. Right. I think there are, uh, yeah. the, the, the kind that make you, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, laugh through your tears, I guess. Yeah. Uh, and that's another very valid source of humor, you know, another valid expression of humor, let's say, or another mode of humor is laughing through tears. Once again, I think all of my films, it, it, it could be considered comedy, frankly, you know, and the fact that some of the, pe the the characters in the films take themselves very seriously is often a source of humor. That's a, that's a classic mode of humor that goes back forever. So, uh, yeah, humor is, is crucially important. And I, I just, with my new film, I remember hearing about some reaction, uh, I won't mention from where that the film was very somber and dark and and I, my reaction was, well, I guess they didn't get the jokes. <laughs> that was my reaction. And, uh, it still stands, you know, we'll see how, you know, we'll see how the film was re received, but that's my attitude. There are jokes in there. Like pretty, pretty good ones. I can't wait. I can't wait. And, and it does seem like, you know, since you mentioned the brood, this is a point, uh, uh, a moment to confess that, uh, uh, especially on a, on a show that's on the, the Romero foundation network that. Uh, uh, true stories about my, 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 uh, my own life and history is that I showed Night of the Living Dead at my bar mitzvah party. <laughs> and, and when my parents told me they were getting divorced, I told my dad, he needs to sit down with me and watch the brood. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, and did he? Oh, oh, he did. Uh, yeah, my parents are both social workers, psychologists. So, I mean, hmm. they, they saw this as a, uh, a healthy expression of, of, uh, uh, wanting to communicate. Uh, and, and they've always actually supported my interest in horror because they've seen it as even from the very early days where, you know, I, as a parent now might, might've been a little more shaking in my shoes. They, they, uh, they saw it as, as a healthy way of pursuing the things that I was wrestling with. Right. Uh, right. Well, it was certainly that for me, you know, the, making that film, I gotta tell you, it was, it was, I had a, my childhood dentist who was my dentist into my adult life up to a point, his name was Dr. Oifer. And, um, he said, you know, the reason I haven't seen any of your films is I don't see films like that. I have enough horror in my own life. I thought, whoa, okay, this is the guy with drill. He's about to, you know, he's, he's inflicted pain on me since I was a kid. Um, so I thought that was an interesting approach. That that approach would be, I just don't want to know about it, you know, uh, rather than that, let's get into it. Let's have some catharsis. Let's have some understanding so we can get through this. Now, his attitude was, I'm only, I only want to see light comedies that, won't challenge me and it won't hurt me, won't hurt me. And one of the ways that it can, a film can hurt me is that it can reflect things back to me about myself and my life, including pain that I'm trying to avoid and understanding that I'm trying to avoid as well. And so these are, you know, I, I said, I wouldn't, I absolutely am fine with that. Dr. Roy, for you don't, and just please put the drill down. <laughs> Yeah, that's, uh, that's, 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 uh, uh, a very Cronenbergian story. Thank you for sharing. <laughs> I haven't thought, I haven't thought of dear Dr. Roy for, for many years, but yeah, yeah. Well, I think now he comes back to life, at least in this story, I can actually almost see him and he was an interesting character. Yeah. I, I, I bet he's in there somewhere in your, your gallery of doctors and scientists and, uh, yeah. 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 People who, 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 uh, who, you know, who are involved with, uh, with, with pain in, in personal and professional ways. So oh. absolutely. One last, last, you know, brief thing to, uh, to ask because my students, you know, would, would never forgive me if I didn't take this opportunity, sure. To sure. which is, is there a particular significance to the Pittsburgh reference in video drill? Pittsburgh is one of the few North American cities that still has streetcars. 
and Toronto has streetcars. And so I could do a shot crossing a road where you could see streetcar tracks. And I think there's actually a streetcar in the shot. And uh, so that's the real connection. But if people want to think of it as an homage to George, please go ahead. I'd be happy to have that. <laughs> and, and, and sadly, the streetcars in Pittsburgh are no more, but I'm glad they live on in Toronto. Well, we still have them in Toronto. They're very sleek, very modern looking, very European. They're quite beautiful, actually. They're quite stunning vehicles. Yes, yes, absolutely. And, uh, uh, and thank you so much for, for, for being with us, David. It's, it's been an honor and a pleasure to, to, to speak with you. And, uh, uh, I, I, I do hope we, we, we have another opportunity and, uh, best of luck to you with, uh, with your, your new film and your work to come and, uh, looking forward to, to much, much more. Well, thanks so much. Alan. I mean, this has really been a pleasure for me and the, the interviews are not always, <laughs> so this has been, this has been good. It's been very, it's very, then very cathartic for me. <laughs> I, I'm glad to hear it. And okay. I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.